Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to the Mulana Sulaiman Ravid show here on ITV. As part of our series on the final sermon of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we've covered many topics over the last few weeks. And this evening we're going to delve into a few a multitude of topics, um, not just one topic as we've been doing for the past few weeks. Mulana, assalamu alaikum, welcome to the show. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Muhammad, it's always a pleasure to share the the platform with you. Jazakallah so much. Well, I know there's many lessons we can take from the final sermon of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah, over the last few weeks, we've been through quite a few already. Some really important ones, we've really gone into it in quite, uh, quite a bit of detail. This evening, I think we can go through a few other of the themes, maybe not in so much detail as the other shows, but try and get the gist of the entire sermon. And the one I'd like to begin with is upholding consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sermon mentioned, remember one day you will appear before Allah and answer for your deeds. You know, this is such a beautiful belief in Islam. Belief in the year after, belief in the fact that you will have to stand before Allah and you will have to account for your deeds. Now, you know, when we were small, they taught us kalimas. Amantu billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wal yawmil akhiri wal qadri khayrihi wa sharrihi min Allah ta'ala. So wal yawmil akhir, wal ba'thi ba'd al mawt. We were small, we memorized it, uh, we, we memorized the translation. I hear my kids now and then, they can rattle it. You tell them, say the six kalima, they can rattle it, say the translation. It's good, I'm not saying, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. And as we, we grew older, we got to understand that, look, we, we can, as Muslims, we believe there's life after death, that death does not bring your soul to an end. Right? A, ma a human is a combination of body and soul. That's why uh, when, when your fetus is in the womb of your mother, you're nothing until the soul is blown in. Right? And, and if, the body, if, the, if the baby is born without a soul, it's called a stillborn baby, it's immediately buried. And when the soul is taken out of the body, the body has no value. So primary between the two is the soul. And, and interestingly, they say if you don't nourish the soul, but you nourish the body, you create an imbalance. Mm. The body is physically thriving, but the, the soul is spiritually weak. And that imbalance is what creates a lot of this uh, mental and emotional issues that people have, psychological issues. Because internally, you're not, you're not balanced. Physically, you're very strong and spiritually, you're very weak. But anyway, that, that's a different discussion for, for another day. The point I wanted to make here is that the soul, we believe, continues. Death is merely the separation, the taking out of the soul from the body. The soul does not cease to exist. It continues into the realm of barzakh, which is a kind of a transit lounge, if you like, and then into the everlasting life of the akhirah. So this is part of our belief. It's, it's part of the fundamental creed of a Muslim, that you, you, there's life after death. Now, what does life after death entail? There's two broad aspects to it. One is accountability, right? Well, uh, in akhir, the last day, the day of qiyamah, uh, Maliki Yomi Deen, the day of, of, of judgment, right? And then after that, it's either eternal success or, or eternal failure or punishment and then, and then reward. So why this constant reminder that you are going to have to stand before Allah? You see, because human beings are such, if you don't look at, look at an atheist or, or an agnostic, they have nothing really that, that, that there's, that's an internal mechanism that keeps them in check. Firstly, you determine your own values. You determine for yourself what's right and what's wrong, what's good and bad. And then they'll say, you know what, the wrong is what is wrong in the eyes of the beholder. You may feel something's wrong, I don't feel something's wrong. You know what, I can steal. You may feel it's wrong, I'll feel, you know what, it's not wrong because I'm stealing from a rich person. Or society is corrupt, life is not fair. So, you know, so that's the one problem. You start determining right and wrong for yourself because you feel you're only accountable to yourself. And secondly, the only thing that can hold you into check is the law. But the, the arm of the law is not as long as we think it is, right? If there's, if there's 10,000 people speeding on, on, on the road in a day, how many get caught? Mm. If there are 10,000 10, people that steal every day, how many get caught? Even in the societies or in the countries where the police force is not as, uh, let's say, as weak as it is here in South Africa. Because you are being monitored by humans. The law is there, but the law will only regulate you if you get caught. So 
A person who doesn't believe in the year after, his only objective is I must not get caught. As long as I don't get caught, as long as I can get away with it, I'm, 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 I secure the benefit of whatever I want to do. So if I want to cheat on my wife, as long as my wife doesn't know, it's good, right? As long as nobody catches me. If I'm cheating a customer, as long as the customer doesn't know. If I'm breaking the law, as long as I'm not found out, I don't have to face the, the music. Or if I can bribe myself out of it, then why not? Why not? So there's no internal mechanism that keeps you in check. As long as the policeman is not there, as long as the law is not, uh, you know, directly aware of what you're doing, you do whatever you want. And that's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when you lose that internal mechanism, you can refer to it otherwise as haya also, yeah. that you're not feeling shy that there's someone greater watching you, then fa'al ma that you'll end up doing whatever you want to do. And that's why we see the kind of chaos that we see in the world. There's no sense of accountability. As long as I, I'll get away with it in terms of the electorate, they won't know. They'll vote me again into office. No problem, I'll do it. As long as my wife won't know, I'll do it. As long as society won't know, I'll do it. Now, a Muslim who believes in this consciousness that I will have to stand before Allah, that you can be in the darkest of the night. Your wife might not know, society might not know, the community might not know, but deep down you know that Allah knows. And if it doesn't stop you from not doing it, at least it will prompt you to repent. At least you'll have some guilt. Yeah. At least you'll feel bad about it. And that's what keeps a human in check. That's what keeps a human in check. Secondly, this, this world is a very unfair place. I mean, justice is not always served. I think in more instances than not, justice is not served. Right? So I did you down. You took me to court. I can afford a fancy lawyer. I got off on some technicality. Where's justice for you? Mm. You can become totally despondent and depressed. You can become demoralized. You can lose your will to live. Because you can feel that I've been dealt a very cruel blow. I'm the victim here and I'm the one who loses everything. But when you believe in the year after, you know that when we stand in front of Allah, there will be ultimate justice. When we stand in front of Allah, then the records, you know, there's no docket that will go missing in the, in, in the Akhirah. Like it, like it is mentioned in Surah Kahaf, it will be said, Mali had al kitab. What a book! Whether it's a major action or a minor action, major statement or a minor action, a minor statement, everything is there. Everything will be present. It's like nowadays, you know, one flesh drive. Isn't difficult for us to understand? One small flesh drive like this, and the person's his, his books for his whole life are there. Right? All his financial statements are there. The whole book, the Hisab Kitab is there, as they would say. And Allah says, nobody will be oppressed. You know, justice will prevail. Justice will prevail. So when you believe in, in, this, in this concept of, of the, the Akhirah, Malik Yomiddin, that Allah is the, the owner of the day of judgment, Allah will be the preside. No one can bribe Allah, no one can crook Allah, no, no one can fool Allah. And, and, and Allah's justice is ultimate. Allah's justice is precise. So it gives you a lot of hope. It gives you a lot of hope that at least I'll get my, my restitution there. Uh, but at the same time, it creates a lot of fear in you that I have to stand before Allah on the day of Qiyamah and account for my deeds. Like Allah says in, in Surah Rahman, وَلِمَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ جَنَّةً That that person who fears that one day he will have to stand before Allah, for him is double the reward. Now, sometimes the devil beguiles us into thinking that, okay, okay, you will stand before Allah on the day of Qiyamah, but Allah is very merciful. Allah will forgive you. There will be the intercession of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There will be this, there will be that. We have no guarantee that Allah will forgive us. But even if Allah forgives us, this verse of Surah Rahman is telling us that, listen, don't you feel shy to stand before Allah knowing what Allah has done for you and then knowing the wrongs that you have done against Allah? Mm. It's like that kid who comes home and he failed. His father has done so much to put him through school that that embarrassment of having to show his report card to his father, even though he knows that ultimately his father will forgive him. Mm. Right? Where will the father, what will the father do? He'll, he'll scream and shout and huff and puff and ultimately, I mean, you're still his son, right? He's got to, he can't, he can't throw you out. He'll threaten, but he won't throw you out. So you know that my father will forgive me. You know that my father will love me and respect him. You know your father won't follow through on the threats. You know, I'll take your cell phone away and I'll take your car away and I'll do this. He'll be angry, but he'll get over it. But the embarrassment of having failed him, that is worse than the failure in itself. So that is what Allah is talking to us about. That listen, have such consciousness of Allah that you fear to disappoint Allah. That you fear to make Allah angry because of your love for Allah and Allah's love for you. And if you can develop that consciousness for you is a double reward. And that is what taqwa is all about. 
Sometimes we just simply translate taqwa as fear. Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not a wrong translation, but it's an incomplete translation. Consciousness of Allah. But in order to, to have consciousness, you need to constantly remind yourself. And that's why so many verses of the Quran remind us. Ittaqullah, 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 wa huwa ma'akum ayna ma kuntum. Allah is with you wherever you are. That, uh, you know, worship Allah as if you can see him. But if you can't bring yourself to that level that you worship Allah as if you can see him, then no, Allah is watching you. That's why Luqman said to his son, if you want to sin, that sin, but sin in a place where Allah can't see you. Right? Meaning that there's no place where Allah can't see you. And Allah is aware of everything. And that consciousness is what guides a Muslim. In the end of the day, sometimes people are shocked that, hey, I left my wallet somewhere and you brought it back in today's time and age. And you say, well, Allah knows. That I found it and I knew it wasn't mine, it was yours. And sometimes people come and say, you know, I have this amanat of yours, this possession of yours, this is yours. Um, I, 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 I met a brother in Canada recently and he, he had the Bal Mubarak. Yeah. He brought us the, the, the pouch with, with one strand of the blessed hair of Rasulullah And he told us an interesting story. He said his parents were in India and he never knew that they had this because he had at a very early age moved over to, to settle in Canada and long after his father had passed away and his brother had passed away, he went to visit one day. His parents were no longer there, his brother was no longer there, but his brother's wife was there. And she told him, I got one amanat of yours, but I'm hoping that you won't want to take it and you'll give it to me. So he said, yeah, I thought it must be something like some household yeah. thing and be, technically it belongs to me now because I'm the son. And I said, ah, whatever it is, I'm sure you can keep it. Then he said, but what is it, by the way? And when she told him that, he said, no, this I can't give you. I can't pass up the opportunity to have the blessings of the blessed strand of hair of Rasulullah in my home. So the question came to my mind as I was walking out. You know, she could have just kept quiet. Yeah. But you see, it's that consciousness that as blessed as this is, more blessed than this is the command of Allah. Because this blessing will turn into a burden for me if it belongs to someone else and I keep it. Now, no one would have known. He didn't even know it was there. But Allah knows. And that's the beauty of consciousness of Allah. Brana, a few minutes ago you mentioned that no matter how much consciousness we have of, of Allah in our hearts, shaitan will always be there making, trying to lead us astray. And during the sermon, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, take note of shaitan's presence and plot to corrupt your heart and your soul. Beware of shaitan for the safety of your religion. He has lost all hope that he will ever be able to lead you astray in big things. So beware of following him in the small things. Hmm. You see the Quran so beautifully says, Inna shaitana lakum That shaitan is an enemy to you. So treat him as an enemy. Don't become complacent. Don't become complacent. You know, they, they, in English, they have all these things. You're only as strong as your weakest link. Yeah. Right? You can have the best alarm system, but if you leave the one door open one day, that's all that it takes. Yeah. So when it comes to our physical properties, we are always on the guard for our material possessions. Close the door, lock the door, put the alarm on, have immobilizer, have this, have that. We're conscious. We're always um, you know, on our nerves, so to speak. At night, you'll walk around, you'll check. Every window must be closed. The front gate is closed. The front door is closed. The trolley door is closed. Everything is locked. All the beams are working and the alarm is on. Why? Because you value your, your house, you value your car that's parked in the garage, you value your life. But you need to value your faith the most. You need to value your iman the most. So Allah is saying, who's the man on the prowl? We know at night there are criminals on prowl uh, wanting to get our cars and wanting to get our jewelry and wanting to get our cash and wanting to get into our homes. And we take all of these security measures. We take them seriously. We know that they are serious in wanting to do what they want to do. So we take them seriously. So Allah says the same thing. But listen, when it comes to Iblis, take him seriously. He's not playing around. He's not playing games. Iblis was in the, in, 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 in the heavens. And, and, and he refused to prostrate before Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, out of his pride and arrogance. Then he put up an argument in a khairum min. Then he started blaming Allah, waliyadu billah, then, oh Allah, you misguided me. And then he asked Allah, he asked Allah and he said, that grant me restraint up to the day of Qiyamah so that I can misguide them. ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ وَعَنْ إِيمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ And Allah said that, okay, that uh, you will be granted that, uh, that, that, that uh, respite. So he has made it his life's mission. He hasn't left the best of the best. He hasn't left the best of the best and he will try. 
that the more spiritual you are, the stronger you are as a Muslim, the stronger his attempts. Look, the more gold you have, the more money you have, the more wealth you have, the more fancy your car, the more expensive your car, the more the attempts they're going to make on yeah. you. Right? Because there's, 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 greater, there's a greater prize at stake. And the more, because the more sophisticated your alarm system is, the more fancy they're going to try, the criminals, in, 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 in an attempt to get in. So Allah is saying, the devil wants to steal your faith. He wants to steal your iman. If he can't steal it, he wants to compromise it. So treat him seriously. Inna shaytana lakum aduwan aduwan. Then Allah talks to us about a particular style or a particular strategy of the devil. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu That O oh, you who believe, La tattabi'u khutuwat shaytan Don't follow in the footsteps of the devil. Now the scholars have asked the question that Allah could have said that don't follow the devil. Why Allah says don't follow in the footsteps of the devil? And this year is a very remarkable thing. Allah is talking to us about the strategy of the devil. You see, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that in the main, Shaitan knows it's very difficult to turn a non-Muslim away from Islam. In the main. You get those that, that uh, ideologically are weak, etc. And, and, and he, can, he can prey on them. But in the main, if he comes to a Muslim and whispers into him, into his heart that, hey, you know what, go and worship an idol. He's not going to do it. Even if he's the weakest yeah. of Muslims. Right? Go and worship the sun. Go and say, yes, I believe that Isa is the son of God, alayhi salam. But what he will do is he will, he will gradually try and mislead you. That's why Allah talks about footsteps. If someone has traversed a particular path, you can't see the person. Yeah. You can't see where they have ended up, where they have landed. But if you continue to follow their footsteps, one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time, eventually you will go where they went. Yeah. And if somebody chokes a path for you with their footsteps, then you'll end up where they want you to end up. And that is how the devil misleads believers. That's why Allah said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, that O oh, you who believe, la tattabi khutawati shaitan. He'll start with small, small things. Right, so he, 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 may, he, may, you know, he may come to you and say, hey, that's a beautiful woman. Maybe you should cheat on her. And you'll say, no, 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 no. Hey, zina is a very horrible mm. thing in Islam. So then he'll say, just chat with her. Chat with her. You're not good. You love your wife. You love your wife. You don't have the guts to go beyond that. You know that. So just chat with her. Take a little bit of pleasure from chatting with her. So there you start WhatsApping and then step by step. I'm just giving one example. Yeah. Interest also, ugh, you know what, just, 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 just this one deal. You need it at this moment. So do this one deal and then, so that's, that's the strategy of the devil. And that's what we need to be careful of because in the end of the day, don't get, don't fall into the trap. It's a minor sin. Yeah. A mountain is made up of all small, small pebbles. And any transgression of the command of Allah is major in the eyes of Allah. Well, and once again, you put it so beautifully. We're going to take a short break now. When we come back, we're going to start unpacking some more of the beautiful advices given by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the Ummah during the final sermon. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the Mulana Suleiman Ravid Show here on ITV. For the last few weeks, we've been discussing the final sermon of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this evening, we're unpacking a few of the very important uh, bits of advice that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave to the Ummah on that eventful day on the plains of Arafah. Um, something that's really important that we all know about, uh, we've learned about it from, from the time we were kids, the five pillars of Islam. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, during the sermon mentioned, O oh people, listen to me in earnest, worship Allah, say your five daily prayers, fast during the month of Ramadan, give your zakah, and perform hajj if you can afford to. You know, I, I have been saying something for quite some time, that the solution to the problems of the Ummah is coming back to the basics. There, there are numerous hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when the Nabi of Allah was asked by Sahaba that, you know, man, you know what, is the, what is the way to success? What is the way to salvation? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say some of the things, uh, you know, redirecting them towards the fundamentals. Now, all Muslims tick the first box in terms of belief in Allah and, and the correct belief. But belief is one thing and strength of belief is another thing. Having Iman is one thing and the strength of your Iman is, is another thing altogether. And uh, we need to be constantly working on improving our Iman. How many of us actually do it? It's your, it's your, it's your greatest asset, right? And uh, the thing is that if it's your greatest asset, then why is it that you are not preserving it? Why is it that you're not looking to, to, to nourish it? Why is it you're not looking to grow it, to enhance it? Imam Bukhari used to say, Al -imanu yazidu wa that Iman increases and decreases depending on your uh, on your actions, depending on what you do in life and what you don't do. So based on that, we need to understand that uh, we need to be constantly taking stock as Muslims. What is the state of my Iman? 
Sahaba used to come to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and say, Ya Rasulullah, I feel there's been a decrease in my iman. You know, why did, uh, why did Yaqub Alayhi Salaam cry so much for his son Yusuf Alayhi Salaam and that he lost his eyesight, even though we know that he knew that Yusuf Alayhi Salaam was still alive and that he knew because of the dream that eventually it will all work out for Yusuf Alayhi Salaam. So, of course, he was pained by the separation that his son was not there and he was worried, where's my son, how's my son? But he knew his son was alive and he knew his son would, uh, would, would eventually... Uh, be, be, be a success story because that is what the interpretation of the dream was and the scholars give a remarkable answer they say that um, he was worried whether the condition and the strength of the iman of Yusuf alayhi salam was appropriate for them of, of a son of a Nabi so I know my son is somewhere I know he's alive I know he's healthy I know he's a Muslim but is he a strong enough Muslim that is what he was weeping about uh, and how, how many of us actually think about that in terms of what is the strength of the, of the faith of my children? We look at a report card. Hey, how good is your maths? Maths is not good. Now you have to go for remedial uh, tuition. Uh, what is the strength of your iman, my son? And you, it's not only about asking the question. It's about seeing it via the actions of your son or your daughter, your, yourself, your spouse. How often do spouse talk to each other about matters pertaining to faith? So, you know, it's something we take for granted. It's our greatest asset, iman, but it's something that uh, we, we, we take for, for absolute granted. Uh, or granted in an absolute sense. And, and, and uh, so you need, to, you need to constantly work at improving your iman. And how do you do that? By talking more about Allah, by reminding yourself about what life is about, by reading Quran, by giving your soul the spiritual nourishment that keeps the flames and the fires of, of, of iman burning. So that's the first thing from the five pillars of Islam. Then the second thing, and I mean, this is where we fall short the most is salah. You know, Umar radiallahu anhu once wrote a letter to all his governors. This was a state letter. And he didn't talk about policy. He didn't talk about, uh, you know, military, nothing. He said, in my opinion, the most important thing is your salah. If you protect your salah, you have protected your deen. But if your salah is compromised, then your entire deen is vulnerable. That's why it is said that salah is the foundation of deen. Now today you see people working very hard, sometimes for their businesses, sometimes for their careers, sometimes for good causes, and they neglect salah. They either miss salah or they rush in their performance of salah or they are negligent when it comes to salah. Until and unless we do not get our salah in order, we're not going to enjoy prosperity individually as an ummah. So you can have all your political solutions and economic solutions and social solutions and have your think tanks and have your seminars and have your conferences and have your blueprints. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but you need all of that is a vehicle. The vehicle needs the fuel to move and the fuel is the blessings of Allah and the blessings of Allah won't come if your fundamentals are not in order. Salah is the call to your creator. Salah is your daily connection with Allah. I mean, this cell phone that we have, we know, no matter what make it is, whether it is iPhone or Samsung or what, the battery is going to run down. So it needs a connection to a plug point and we need a connection to Allah to spiritually keep ourselves uh, energized. And, and the greatest spiritual energy comes to us via Salah amongst the many, many other benefits of Salah. Yes, zakah is also there. Maybe we are not as deficient in zakah when it comes to, to salah. Fasting also people keep it, but it's about the, 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 the quality of it and hajj. But these are the fundamentals, right? And, and it's especially those first two because zakah comes once a year and it's applicable to a certain group of people who have the wealth. Fasting comes once a year, hajj comes once in a lifetime. But these are the two fundamentals. We need to be constantly checking, we need to be constantly evaluating, and we need to be constantly working to see how we can improve. And I can guarantee you, if we can get our Iman in order, and if we can get our Salah in order, half if not more of our individual and collective problems will be resolved. Molana, you mentioned it so beautifully once again. I think it's what you, the gist of it, let's get back to basics. Let's get our the, the things that we learned about from the time we were kids, right? If we can get that right, inshallah, the Ummah can come, right? We're going to take a short break now. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the Mulana Sulaiman Ravid show here on ITV. For the last few weeks, we've been discussing the final sermon of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this evening we're concluding with the lessons from that sermon. So many lessons were given to us, and I don't think we'd ever be able to do justice to the full sermon. May Allah give us the strength to do it. Maybe at another Amen. time we can go through maybe more of the themes. But this evening we're just going through a few themes we've discussed. 
uh, Allah consciousness taqwa, um, prioritizing the five pillars of Islam, taking note of shaitan's presence and the plot to corrupt, corrupt our hearts and our souls. In this segment, we're going to conclude with the importance of dawah, um, using the Quran and the Sunnah as a reference point in our life, and finally, to be just, trustworthy, and the harms of interest that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so beautifully warned us about. Mulana, in the sermon, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Mention all those who listen to me shall pass on my words to others and those to others again. That really gives us the importance of dawah and taking Islam to, to everybody. You know, we spoke about this in the other program where we were talking about uh, the finality of prophethood, also linked to the final sermon, that there is no Nabi to come after Rasulullah And that's why dawah is a responsibility of every ummati, not only uh, the, the, uh, the ulama or the knowledgeable or those who who go out in the path of Allah wa ta'ala specifically. And, and da'wah can take many forms. You know, da'wah is to Muslims, da'wah is to non-Muslims in a broad sense, in, in, to Muslims in, in the form of a reminder that this is right, this is wrong. And you know, we see the, the brothers standing up in the masjid all the time. And you know, I always, I always marvel that uh, that message is so basic, right? You could kind of like know it off by heart, respected brothers and elders, my success and your success. but. When it's such an apt reminder, it's something over which we need reminder all the time, all the time. And then to non-Muslims as well. One is, you know, like Ahmad did that kind of thing where you go and you show them, you know, you compare and you show them why the Quran is the word of Allah and why there has been distortion in the Bible or why there has been distortion uh, in, the, in the Torah, etc. and the inconsistencies and that kind of thing. The other is you go and you explain uh, Islam to people. And, and this is something where you know, the South African Muslim community is renowned the world over for many strengths. Uh, uh, that, you know, we haven't been in this country all that long compared to, 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 to other countries, but uh, our religious infrastructure is, is comparatively strong. Our masjids, our maktabs, our Muslim schools, even our ulama bodies, our, 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 our Muslim media sector. But the one area where we've been very weak is dawah. You have some people who have a passion for it. I know one mufti from Newcastle. He carries a Quran in his pocket wherever he meets, whoever. He'll strike up a conversation in a very diplomatic way and he'll tell them what Islam and many people, people you wouldn't have expected. I think he came to the one Ijtima and he spoke to one of the guards and he got them to, to revert to the deen. So you know where there's a will, there's a way. Um, the late Maulana Yunus Patel, it is, it is mentioned about him that every domestic that worked in his house accepted Islam. Now, how many domestics we have heard? We can talk about the number of domestics that we have hired. Mm. How many uh, people have worked in our homes, uh, have worked in our businesses, non-Muslims, have we brought them closer to Islam? What impression, uh, what image of Islam did we grant to them? Uh, what did we reflect in terms of our conduct, in terms of our character as to what Islam is? Because in the end of the day, when Aisha radiallahu anha was asked about the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa she said, Kana khuluquhu al-Quran. The Quran was exemplified in the conduct of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You could see the Quran in how the Nabi of Allah spoke, in how the Nabi of Allah acted, in how the Nabi of Allah reacted, in what he did, in how he did, in when he did. So we we need to understand that 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 dawah is when you yourself become a flag bearer of Islam, yeah. And the, and then obviously it's it's a little bit more than that conduct and all of that softens people brings them closer. But then you need to also know your deen. You also need to, and it's not all that difficult. There are a number of people I know who just had a bit of passion. <laughs> they did a bit of reading, and they went out there. And Alhamdulillah, people and 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 the hadith says if Allah guides one person because of you, it's better than red camels. And red camels in those days were like the red Ferraris of of, of this day. That it's better for you than all of these luxuries and fineries of the world. Because whatever that person does afterwards, you will get the equivalent reward in terms of the good. And it will continue in that person's progeny, right? Because when they accept Islam, then they try and make their spouse accept Islam. They try and make their parents accept Islam. They try and make their siblings accept Islam. And many times they succeed. Or even if they don't, then their children that come afterwards will be born into, uh, into, into Muslim homes. And there are many businessmen. Like, I mean, I know one businessman, a very prominent businessman. That he does his business, but he's always talking to his non-Muslim business partners or his non-Muslim associates. So even the, the plumber that will come out to his house, he talks to them about Islam. What, what stops us? There are so many people who have accepted Islam on the hands of an ordinary Muslim. And I say ordinary, I mean not a scholar, not a person formally trained in doing da'wah. I'm not saying you, you, know, you shouldn't be formally trained. If you are formally trained, you can do a better job of it. But if your passion is the most important thing. 
understanding your deen and representing the basics of your deen, then you can hand the person over to the scholars. After they have embraced the faith, then they go to the ulama and they learn the different masail and they learn the aqidah and they get the, you know, the detailed guidance in terms of, of, what is, uh, of what is required. So each one of us as Muslims, we need to, we need to ask ourselves, how much of da'wah am I doing? In terms of my conduct and akhlaq, how many people have been impressed about Islam because of me? And I said, oh wow, I see this in you and this tells me a story about the belief that you have and the religion that you subscribe to. And how many people have I spoken to about Islam? I mean, you must not miss these opportunities. You're sitting on a plane, sometimes you're going from here to Dubai and you're eight hours sitting next to one person and you chat a little bit about cricket and a little bit about soccer and a little bit about politics. Why not? Sometimes people ask questions. Sometimes people raise objections. Mm. You know, you're traveling with your wife and she's covered and you want to know, ah, but why must your wife cover? Very hostile. But if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you use the opportunity well, you can actually turn that person's sentiments, you can answer that person nicely and you can then make that person realize what are the beauties of Islam. But you need to have the passion, you need to have the bit of know-how and then you, you turn to Allah wa ta'ala, and you leave the rest in the hands of Allah because hidayat comes from Allah. Even, even though Nabi wasallam was the greatest da'i, no one could do da'wah better than Nabi wasallam could, but his uncle was not decreed to accept Islam and, and to embrace the faith. Inna kala tahdi man ahbabta wa lakinna Allah yahdi man yasha. In the end of the day, you cannot guide those whom you want to be guided. It's who Allah wants you to be guided. But you must be desirous that I must be a means. I must be a means through which other people are guided. You put it again, like just the way you mentioned it, a story comes to mind that a few years ago um, in Greenside, the area that we, we, we come from, a young Chinese boy used to walk past the masjid every day. He didn't speak to anybody and just by looking at the discipline of the Salah itself, um, within two weeks, this guy was about 20 or 21 years old, he reverted and when you meet this man today, I think he's memorized 15 paras of the Quran already. Mm -hmm. And that's just by looking at the people performing Salah and that was the overflow of the Musallis outside the masjid. So just on that discipline, so the importance of our discipline, of our akhlaq and our character cannot be understated. But another the next thing we'd like to speak about is using the Quran and the Sunnah as reference points. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, Oh people, no prophet or apostle will come after me and no new faith will be born. We did mention this in the previous show on the finality of Nubuwa. But he also mentioned, reason where therefore, O people, and understand my words which I convey to you. I leave behind me two things, the Quran and my example, which is the Sunnah. And if you follow these two things, you will never go astray. I think that it's so beautifully put once again. I think, again, it's, it's sad that we have lost our connection with the Quran and Sunnah. How many of us have a holistic, established relationship with the Quran? Holistic, established. Holistic meaning... You read Quran, you listen to the recitation of Quran, you learn the meaning of Quran, you read authentic the tafsir and commentaries, you, you practice upon the injunctions of the Quran and you spread the message of the Quran. That's a holistic relationship with the Quran and a holistic relationship with the Sunnah. How many of us read Quran outside the month of Ramadan? How many of us listen to recitation of Quran outside the month of Ramadan? How many of us have read one book of tafsir in our lives from first para to the, to the last para? How many of us have read the tafsir of Surah Yaseen? How many of us sit when a tafsir program takes place in the masjid? Right? So it's nice to say Quran and Sunnah, but what is the state of my relationship with Quran and Sunnah? How many of us have read a seerah book in the last year? Whereas the scholars tell us that you must, you must target every single year of my life, I must read at least one new book on seerah. Because every author will bring to the fore a different dimension in the life. The story is the same. I mean, the life story yeah. of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will not change. Yeah. The hadith will not change. There's no new hadith that will come out from somewhere. But every author will bring forth a different dimension, a different angle, a different point of wisdom, a different point of inspiration, a different point of reflection. And that is why you must read as much as you can about Quran and Sunnah. We spend copious amounts of time on our, 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 our gadgets, be it the cell phone or the tablet or the or the laptop, but how much of that time is actually spent? Because technology has made it easier. Yeah. Now today with one app, you got the Quran you, app, you can listen, you can get the translation, you can get the commentary, authentic, everything. But do you read? How many people actually read? How many people make it part of their daily routine to read? About, to read from Quran and to read from Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if we don't come back to that, then where will we ever find the solution to our problems? It's not that you must go there and interpret, that's a science. And in order to, for you to qualify in that science that you don't need to go and study, right? So it's like this. You cannot diagnose and you cannot uh, give people medication because that is, that's a science you need to go and study six years for it to become a doctor. But what stops you from reading about good health? 
What's, what stops you from reading about what's beneficial to your health and what's harmful to your health that you must do, even if you're not a doctor. So as a Muslim, the general themes of the Quran, we need to, we need to learn what is the meaning of Allah's love letter to humanity. That is what the Quran is. We say that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the Khatam al Nabi, and we had an entire prophet, uh, we had an entire program on it. We're saying that uh, his example is the everlasting example. We're saying his example is the best example. How much do we know about that example? How much, for how long can we speak about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You take, you take a 17 year old and you tell him, right, speak. Real Madrid or Barcelona, Messi or, or Ronaldo, and he will speak for hours. He can debate. Passionately, he can hold his own. He'll take on and challenge his own father on, on that particular matter. But tell that same person, take that same adult and say, speak about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for one hour. And after five minutes, you'll run out of things to say. You will end up repeating the same thing in different ways. Why? Because our level of love is there, but our level of knowledge is so shallow. So Quran and Sunnah, also that we must not misunderstand. Quran and Sunnah doesn't mean that you can't have fiqh. Yeah. Because fiqh is derived from the Quran and Sunnah. It doesn't mean that there won't be rulings of, of ulama and scholars because all of that, the Quran gives you the broad principles. The hadith gives you clarity and details to those principles. But those principles will be the principles will give you the basis on which to deduce rulings, uh, you know, from, from, from then up to the day of, uh, of Qiyamah. So it comes back to a point I made earlier on Muhammad that we need to come back to these very yeah. basics. Our Iman, our Salah, the Quran and the Sunnah. Well, I'm just talking about... Um going back to basics and about the knowledge of the seerah and knowledge of the lives of the Sahaba also, just preparing for these shows, um, it took me back, I'm standing in front of those frames and going through the sermon. I mean, we've seen it, but how many times have we actually read the sermon and re really taken from the sermon these lessons? I think we, it's really unfortunate that we haven't really taken this to heart. And if you look at some of the things that were said in the, 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 the advices given by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's for the entire humanity and entire mankind. I think we made this point in the beginning when we did the very first yeah. of these four programs, right? And, and I said that this was a very special speech of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Nabi of Allah gave many sermons, yeah. but this was special because number one, it was Hajj. Number two, it was the day of Arafah. Number three, it was, it was, it was the a very sacred moment. And then it was, also, um, it was also special because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke in front of the largest gathering of Sahaba, approximately 120,000 people. It also became the final sermon because not long after that, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. There may have been smaller sermons thereafter, but this was the large, big, uh, the biggest address, you know, and, and the last, you know, major sermon, if, if you like. So people talk about, you know, Martin Luther King's uh, I have a dream speech and this one's that speech and Umbeki's I am an African speech, etc. Not that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can in any way compare to, to, to you know, any other human, mm. let alone uh, non-Muslims. But from, from the many speeches of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this was, this was the speech. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew, he already knew, because once, once Ida Ja'a Rasulullah was, was revealed, that his time on earth was limited. And, and he, he had a strong sense that that would be his last meeting with, with such a large gathering of Sahaba. And in that sermon, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically said, whoever hears this from me, take it to others. Yeah. So there was a consciousness, this is my final address now to this larger gathering of Sahaba. So it's like, you know, when your father is on his deathbed, when what he tells you then is very different to what he was telling you the previous 30 years, because he knows now, this is my final moment, my final opportunity to say, so what I say here is going to be life changing. What I say here is going to be critical. What I say here is going to be fundamental. And here it's, 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 it's a tragedy that we have adorned our walls, but we have not adorned our hearts and we have not adorned our actions with the pearls of wisdom and the jewels of, of inspiration that are in this uh, final sermon. So I think to wrap, I'll say this, we, we've done four programs. In the first one, we spoke about racism, which, was, which, which, is, which is mentioned in the sermon. In the second one, we spoke about women's rights. In the third one, we spoke about the finality of prophethood. And in this last program, we've been touching on miscellaneous aspects in the, in, in, in the final sermon. We, we cannot do justice to it, even in, in these four programs. But it's, it's hoped that this, these discussions will be of benefit firstly to us and to all the viewers. And also it is hoped that it would be an inspiration for them then to take the initiative to learn, to read this sermon and to learn more about this sermon and to go further into its details and, and, and benefit from it, inshallah. Marana, a few months ago, I think we did a program together and we spoke about the importance of leading and the, uh, reading and the importance of knowledge. I think sometimes as an ummah, we've taken the easy way out. You rather sit on your phone, sit on social media. 
I think that the appreciation for books needs to come back into oh, our lives. Oh, for sure, for sure. You need to, and the only way you'll get it right is if you take out dedicated time and you make it part of your routine to read. If you buy those books and you choose them and you leave them at the place where you can see them and it will remind you, and it's part of your daily routine to read. Molana, Jazakallah so much to our viewers out there. We hope you enjoyed these last four shows that we've done together. May Allah Ta'ala make it a means of our guidance for myself, for everybody else watching. From all of us in the team, have a wonderful evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> واحتفل بالمودة ملاحن ناسا حبك بيض الله قلبك بيض الله قلبك جميل المساعي وملاحن ناسا حبك